This is Susanna Bowling in the Times Square Beat, and today we were with Stuart F. Lane, producer, actor, and writer. Stuart, you just wrote a new book. It's called uh, Black Broadway. It's the African-American contribution to the American theater. Now, when we think African-American contribution, at this point, everyone thinks Audra McDonald. But before <laughs> her, there was Lena Horne, Ethel Waters. Who was the first black performer? Oh, well, we can go back to... Uh, to George Walker and the Ziegfeld Follies. Uh, you can go back to uh, uh, Gilpon, who did the, uh, the Emperor Jones in the 1920s. Some of the early days, there's the heroes of the songwriters like U.B. Blake and Duke Ellington from the 20s, the uh, Golden Age of Harlem, the, what they call the Harlem Renaissance. So yeah, there's a whole slew of the early days. Now, would you say black performers came out of the spirituals? Well, they, you know, there's part of the contribution in terms of music and dance came out of the church and the spirituals. Uh, the tap, whole idea of tap dancing coming from the South, or jazz, uh, you know, original musical art forms that created came out of America, and because of the black contribution. Now, was it the black performer that brought tap to Broadway? Uh, yes, yes it was. Who was it? His, you know, it's funny, his name was Lane, just like me. That first... Uh, un unfortunately, no relation. <laughs> and what show did he bring? Tap uh, it was just a part of a part of a, a review that he did. And who would you say, in terms of chronology, who would be the top black performers that you can look back through and say they they did something? They did something. Well, I think uh, Paul Robeson, certainly with the Showboat, was a major watershed. Not only because of the musical and what it stood for for the American theater, but also uh, the social story it had to tell about mixed interracial marriages. Right. I think James Earl Jones doing The Great White Hope in the late 60s was a major production. I actually got a chance to see that, and it was uh, almost life-changing because it was the power and the message that that show had brought across and how he delivered that. Uh, I think another one, another famous performer I enjoyed so much, Sammy Davis Jr., uh, a man who could sing, dance, act, comedy, tragedy, uh, he could write he, his biography. I mean, he was an amazing, amazing individual. Now, what made you write this book? Well, originally, I had written a book called Jews on Broadway, <laughs> which was the Jewish contribution to the American theater. I love the theater. I love talking about the theater. I love working in the theater. I find it privileged to be able to work and, and, and work uh, within the theater industry and work with such talented, wonderful people. So, uh, so when I wrote, wrote the book Jews on Broadway, I was hoping to expand on it by adding illustrations and photographs, and the publisher was giving me a hard time on that. So when I came up with the idea of- Wait, the, why was the publisher giving you a hard time? Well, even though I was willing to uh, contribute to the purchase of the rights to it, they were concerned about lawyers' fees and, and problems with owning the rights to the photographs. So when it came to Booing Black on Broadway, I was able to find a publisher, Square One Publishing, here on Long Island, and they, uh, he shared my dream with that. So yes, we got Playbill, to uh, Philip Bursch and Playbill helped contribute the Playbill covers, we got posters, we went to the Lincoln Center Library, went to the uh, New York City Library, the Schomburg Museum, New York City Museum, and we were able to gather these photographs. It's amazing, if I do say so myself, uh, an amazing book. Now, as a writer, you always find a great surprise. What was your great surprise in writing this book? There was a wealth of material I didn't know was good, that existed out there. Uh, and, and I learned a little bit of history myself. Was there any performer that you hadn't known about that all of a sudden you learned about? Well, you know, having been in the business as long as I've been, I can say I've lived history. My father always said, if, once you live history, it's easier to remember, that sort of thing. Uh, but it was the, uh, the Harlem Renaissance that really stood out in my mind, and the U.B. Blakes and the Fats Wallers that came out of that. Now, there was a show called by Mickey Grant, Don't Bother Me, I Can't Cope. Would you say that helped change theater in a way? Oh, I think it did. That was, oh, was that off-Broadway? Uh, off-Broadway, but it also went to L.A. and it, it toured all over. Mickey Grant, Mickey Grant was pretty big in that era. Yes, that, that was also the time of the, of the, uh, the blacks. That was done, Jean Genet's The Blacks, that right. was off-Broadway. Godfrey Cambridge, Cleavon Little, uh, James Earl Jones, and, and, and all in one major production. Uh, I think you find in the 1960s major changes going on. I mean, when, once you had, in 57, when uh, you had Raisin in the Sun, right. uh, you know, which, which uh, Kenny Leon, who won a Tony for directing that, also wrote the foreword for my book. Uh, it, I saw it again recently, and the, the, the 
dramatic impact, the timeliness of it works so well. I mean, here's a family struggling to make ends meet, trying to do better, trying to get their kids better, get, get a better way of life. It's the, it's the American story. It's what immigrant family, my family, came over here for the same reasons. And that show resonates so strongly today. Uh, amazing. And that sort of started things going into the 60s as the conventional uh, musical theater storytelling started to come to a close. I think it was Hal Prince who said that uh, Fiddler on the Roof was one of the end of that age when they, because after that they started experimenting with time, less linear stories, different kinds of music. So, but that also means we start dealing with different kinds of casting. You know, Joe Papp, God bless him, brought in this whole rainbow eye casting idea. Well, all of, all of a sudden you can do Shakespeare and they can be black or Puerto Rican or Asian. It doesn't matter who's playing Macbeth, as long as they are a good actor. But he also did something really wonderful. He took eras and places where there would have been blacks. I mean, why they weren't being played by blacks, like a Persian, would have been black. You mean? No, that's what Pap did. So I, I think what Pap did was take what should have always been there and brought it to the forward. Do you, do you agree? Well, he brought it to the forward and made it popular, made it acceptable. Uh, and, 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 and accessible to the public. So I think that was a major force, because all of a sudden you're doing, I mean, why not, why can't James Earl Jones play Big Daddy in Cat on a Hot Tune Roof? You know, we're, 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 we're cheating ourselves by not letting him do something like that. And, uh, you know, 40 years ago, I don't think that would have happened. It's part of the progress. It's part of the, what's happening that's uh, part of the creative process. But we're growing, you know, as a nation, uh, far modern theater is considered only since the 1920s when Eugene O'Neill started to write All God's Chillin' Got Wings and The Emperor Jones right. and when uh, Showboat was a watershed musical that really set the example of what musicals can be, could be, uh, that, that sets us to, what, 50 years, only 60 years later? So we're just at the beginning of America and what we can do and what we can be. And with theater reflecting our culture and our feelings, I think we're on a great track to, uh, to open up to new characters and new ideas. Now, in the book, do you talk about Diane Carroll and No Strings? I do. I do, with her Richard Kiley, breaking new ground with that. There was also a play, I think, S Sweet Charlie, um, Patty Duke. Um, she marries the black, she lives with the black man. I'm not sure about that one. I, I know I've got The Owl and the Pussycat with Alan Alda. Right. And uh, Diane Carroll. Diane right. Carroll, yeah. I've yeah, got that. Um, got hair. You know. <laughs> Pearlie was actually the show that got me wanting to do theater. I saw Leslie Uggam sing, I got, uh, was it God got love? No, Hallelujah Baby. Oh, oh Hallelujah Baby. Oh, Lord, yeah, so right. Funny. So, I mean, a lot of those performers have brought people, more and more people into the theater. Do you see that happening more now? Oh, definitely. I think that, uh, but there's been a whole transition going on more than, than just uh, roles and, and casting, uh, you know, uh, minorities in, in, in roles and in, in characters. I think you've seen New York and Broadway become a center for both film, television, and live theater. You know, we're, back in the 70s in my acting days, you were bi-coastal. Either you were in California with movies and television uh, and New York for film. Right. But basically, uh, you can be in New York now and they've got studios. We've got the Silver Cup Studios, the Steiner Studios. We're filming television. We're filming, uh, we're shooting TV here and, f and stage. So I think that being in one area uh, makes it easier for big name stars to play Broadway as well. So we do get Denzel Washington coming in here. We do get, uh, you know, we get um, James Franco here or Orlando Bloom. Uh, and that makes it all, all the more exciting. Emma Stone, she just brought Cabaret up the ratings. And I hear she is wonderful in it. Now, you used to be an actor. Can we ever see you going back to the boards again? Well, as a matter of fact, uh -huh. about a year ago, I was asked to uh, star in a revival of A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum with Peter Scolari, John Chuck, and uh, Jackie Hoffman at the Bay Street Theater in the Hamptons. And I had a blast doing that for a month in August. So are we going to see you doing something coming up? Uh, well, I'll have to check my calendar to see if it's <laughs> full, but uh, we'll see. And you're bringing a new show in to Broadway this year, if I'm not mistaken. Well, I'm going to be hosting uh, at the Palace Theater an American in Paris, a stage version uh, of the Gene Kelly movie, the famous iconic movie, uh, which just previewed in Paris and got some really nice reviews. Now, with this book, is it, what, was the beauty, what would be the one thing you would want people to take away with? Well, the Broadway arena, like any other creative art form, is constantly changing. And it, it does reflect who we are as a nation, as a people. And the fact that we've come so far, uh, we should be proud of that. And the fact that we can go much further is, 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 is exciting. And I think that can be expressed on the Broadway stage. 
Thank you so much. We've learned a great deal with you. This is Susanna Bowling and the Times Square Beat.